Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to Grand Rounds. Um, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, his name is Dr. Roy Chowdhury. He's a good friend of mine. And um, he is going to talk on nephrology, but in a, from a completely different angle, I would say. Not the traditional acid base, hypokalemia, and so on. But if you notice the title, it's um, Innovation and Renal Medicine. And we were just discussing that is nephrology dead, you know. So when you listen to his talk, you will learn that it's not dead, but it's actually thriving, okay. So Dr. Chaudhary uh, has studied in three continents, in India, in, uh, he was in Scotland, and uh, in, in the U.S. he uh, did his nephrology training at Harvard, he was at the Beth Israel. And uh, he is one of those individuals who uh, can do clinical medicine, he does uh, actually transplant medicine, and uh, who also is very interested in vascular access. And you know, we have a clinical vascular access um, program on the eighth floor outside our dialysis units. We, but Dr. Chow, Chowdhury has established a translational research program at the University of Cincinnati, where we are looking at <laughs> taking the stuff that we do in the lab and putting it out there in the form of how can we improve dialysis vascular access. <coughs> so that's, that's his major theme. And he has been funded He's doing good work, so he's been funded by the NIH, from the VA, and with industry. And several of the trials that we have run here have actually been started by Dr. Chaudhary or have his blessing. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, who has lots of publications in this area, more than 150, is going to talk to us on translation, innovation, and renal medicine. Thank you. All right. Well, <clears throat> at the outset, I'd really li like to thank uh, uh, Ken for inviting me to, to give this Grand Rounds presentation. And, uh, uh, you know, the Division of Nephrology at LSU, I think, has been a leader in my area of interest, which is dialysis vascular access. So it really is a particular pleasure to be able to give this presentation. Uh, I've also had a great time interacting with many of the people uh, in, in the division. Uh, Ken and I were talking just before I, 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 I uh, 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 this talk about whether I should perhaps have changed the title to make it more provocative, as Ken said. And uh, the next time I give this talk, I'm actually going to title it as, Is Nephrology Dead? Uh, and, and, uh, which, uh, and I think it sort of addresses a little bit uh, some, of those, some of those questions. I think the answer is no. So anyway, uh, uh, I'm going to start off. These are my disclosures. And so I'm going to divide this presentation into three main parts. Uh, and, and I will say right at the beginning that uh, I think that this presentation is in fact going to be different from many other Grand Rounds presentations, but I, I just, I feel that it's critically, critically important. Uh, uh, so I'm going to divide this talk into three main parts. Uh, uh, I'm initially going to talk about, let me get my point here, yeah, I'm initially going to talk about dialysis vascular access, which is my area of interest, as an example of translational innovation at a local level. I'm then going to describe to you a national initiative called the Kidney Health Initiative, and I'm going to use this as an example of translational innovation at a national level. And then finally, I'm going to end by telling you a little bit about the global epidemic of end-stage renal disease and chronic kidney disease and make the case that this particular problem is desperately in need of what I've termed as translational innovation. And then finally, I'll end with some messages for the future. <clears throat> Before I start off, however, I really want to go into some definitions. So, Translational innovation is really a combination of translational research and innovation, and I do want to define both of these terms. So translational research, I think, would be familiar to, to most of you, and it has a number of different phases from T1 to T4, and T1 research is basically the process by which you go from a basic scientific discovery, a new molecule, for example, into a potential clinical application, and T1 research includes experimental studies in animals 
uh, and also phase one and phase two research. Uh, T2 studies uh, or T2 research is going from a potential clinical application into evidence-based guidelines and this really comprises uh, your pivotal phase three clinical trial. T3 research is the process by which you go from an evidence-based guideline into actual clinical care and this really includes post-marketing of phase four studies and also outcome studies. And then finally T4 research is the process by which you go from, an, from a standard of care clinical intervention or drug into actually trying to target the health of the community as a whole and this includes research into something that I think particularly in nephrology is very important which is health disparities. So that's about translational research. What about innovation? So innovation is defined uh, either as a new device, idea or method or, and this is very important, as the process of introducing new ideas, devices or methods and we'll speak about the process part in a moment. The way that I think about translational innovation is that it is really the application of innovation to each of these points in the translational research process. Another way of thinking about translational innovation is that it truly is a bedside to bench to bedside process. And so what you do over here is that number one, you need to identify an area of unmet clinical need. And I will come out straight away over here and say that the best people to identify areas of clinical, of unmet clinical need are actually physicians. And the best physicians to identify areas of unmet clinical need are actually very young physicians because you see a problem, you're frustrated by it, and, 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 you, you, and that's a real clinical problem that's out there. The next thing that you need to do is that you need to explore the basic biology of that unmet clinical need and in, within basic biology I would, well not within, but I would include in this demographics and epidemiology as well. The third thing you need to do is you then need to translate new knowledge in the basic biology of these areas of unmet clinical need into diagnostic, prognostic and therapeutic instruments and you then need to test out the application of these instruments both experimentally in animal models and clinically. Throughout this process, and this is very important, you absolutely need to try and think out of the box, both for the discovery of new knowledge, and I think just as importantly, for the process by which new knowledge could be converted into instruments that would actually help human health. Now, we mentioned earlier about process, and this slide basically focuses on discovery innovation versus process innovation. So, as Ken said, I'm, I'm a nephrologist, I'm very interested in fistulae and grafts and dialysis vascular access. So, in this area of vascular access, discovery innovation could perhaps be a new, and I've just made this up, a phototherapy device that could perhaps be used preemptively to prevent dialysis access stenosis. And if in fact it worked with 100% patency, this would be a huge forward step, so a real discovery. Process innovation for this discovery, however, would comprise the development of new models for pragmatic real-time trials that could perhaps be done cheaply in the hemodialysis unit, or it could perhaps be the process of getting a preemptive memorandum of understanding between a dialysis company and CMS that pays the bills to ensure that clinical trials are actually performed because many times you have really good ideas but they just die in what's called the valley of death because nobody is coming up to say we're going to fund, we're going to fund this and as a result I think patients actually suffer at the end of the day. So with that sort of general introduction about translational innovation, uh, I'm going to focus now on dialysis vascular access as an example for translational innovation. And I'm going to share with you some of our own work and also a little bit about our program in Cincinnati. So this is a slide of a, put the lighting a bit more down. So this is a slide of a patient on dialysis. And if you look at this, it's immediately obvious that in order to dialyze a patient, you need three things. You need the patient, you need the dialysis machine, and you need some sort of vascular access. Now, there are two messages in this slide. So the first message is that just by looking at this slide, you can make the case that vascular access is in fact a lifeline for the dialysis patient because that's the only way you can take blood out from a patient 
purify it in a dialysis machine, put it back into the patient. However, because of the many problems associated with dialysis vascular access, and I'm sure that all of you as residents have faced, uh, have come into contact with the, uh, with the patient with a thrombose graft who's in pulmonary edema in the emergency room. So that's a real emergency. So it's the Achilles heel as well for hemodialysis. The second message from this slide is I think perhaps a more important message, and that is that even though dialysis vascular access is a big clinical challenge, the way that we have always looked upon dialysis vascular access within our translational research group, that it's actually an opportunity to be able to make a real and meaningful impact on the quality of life of hemodialysis patients. And I think that this is something that will come out in other parts of the presentation as well. So having said that, I, I'm just going to go through a few basic slides on arteriovenous fistulae, which will set the stage for an innovative, we think it's innovative device that we're very interested in. So the best form of hemodialysis vascular access at the present time is the arteriovenous fistula. And this is basically a connection, and I apologize because this will be repetition for many of you, but it's basically a surgically created connection between the artery and the vein, either at the wrist or at the elbow. And when you create an arteriovenous fistula, you're really connecting up a high flow, high pressure arterial system to a low flow, low pressure, high capacitance venous system. So all the blood from the artery rushes through the anastomotic connection into the vein. And in an ideal world, the vein, which is usually superficial, will dilate up, as shown in this on the right panel. And nurses can then put dialysis needles in, as shown over here by these scar tissue marks, and also shown on this slide. Now, even though, go to the next. Okay. Now, even though the arteriovenous fistula is clearly the best form of dialysis vascular access, it has one big problem, and that is if you place 100 arteriovenous fistulae, about 50 of them will either thrombose or fail or will need some sort of intervention to make them suitable for dialysis. So what does maturation failure, failure actually mean? It means that the vein does not develop an adequate blood flow and diameter to support dialysis. And the most important reason for maturation failure in an arteriovenous fistula is that they develop a very tight perianastomotic stenosis as shown, as shown over here. Now, if you take tissue from this stenotic region over here, and we have done this for the last 10 years in our laboratory, you get the classical histological presentation of AV fistula maturation failure, which is an aggressive venous neointimal hyperplasia, which is made up of smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts and myofibroblasts that have migrated in from the media and perhaps also the adventitia in response to either hemodynamic injury or to surgical stress. Now, even though neointimal hyperplasia is a really important cause for fistula maturation failure, it's important to remember that AV fistula maturation failure, or any sort of stenosis for that matter, is always a balance between the amount of neointimal hyperplasia and the type of vascular remodeling. So if you look at the top panel, you see that even though you have a very significant amount of neointimal hyperplasia, because this occurs in the context of outward or positive remodeling, you actually have a large lumen, and clinically this would be a mature AV fistula that, you could, that the nurses could put needles into. If you look at the bottom panel, you see that even though the amount of neointimal hyperplasia is not so much, but because this occurs in combination with inward or negative remodeling, you actually have a very small vessel lumen size. And again, clinically, this would be what AV fistula maturation failure would look like. So with that sort of general introduction about AV fistula maturation failure, about five years ago, we really wanted to, divide, to develop a device that could target fistula maturation failure. At that time, we basically put together the data that was out there from our laboratory and from the literature, and we tried to identify the three main pathogenetic causes of fistula maturation failure. 
And the three main reasons that we came up with were number one, patients with diabetes and hypertension who have kidney failure often have very small vessels, both arteries but particularly veins that result in poor blood flow when you create a fistula. The second pathogenetic reason that we came up with was that when you create or when the surgeon creates an AV fistula, you've got a high flow of blood through the fistula and this often results in non-laminar flow or turbulent flow or oscillatory shear stress profile. So bad hemodynamics which then results in a lack of dilatation and a more aggressive neointimal hyperplasia. And the third reason that we felt was very important was that all of our patients who get AV fistulae have end-stage renal disease or have chronic kidney disease. And in essence, because of inflammation and oxidative stress, they have bad vascular biology, which then results in, again, in a lack of dilatation and a more aggressive neointimal hyperplasia. So then the question was, is there a therapy that could target all three of these pathogenetic problems. And the therapy or device that we came up with was the placement at the time of fistula creation of a biodegradable magnesium-based stent. And we felt that this stent would work for the following reasons. So number one, we felt that the actual scaffold of the stent would be able to increase the venous segment size and therefore increase flow and diameter. We were very keen on making the stent in a malleable configuration and the idea here was that by getting just the right curve for an AV fistula that we would be able to get laminar flow, so a good hemodynamic profile which would then cause dilatation and less neointimal hyperplasia. And finally, our intent was to coat the stent with a drug or a cell or a gene so that the biodegradable stent itself could then become a conduit for drug delivery so that one could optimize vascular biology at the site of fistula creation. There was one, very, one other very important part of, this, uh, of our innovation, and that was that we felt that the biodegradable stent would really give us an opportunity through all of these pathways to optimize the local milieu in that critical four weeks after fistula creation because there's lots of data to show that if a fistula does well in the first four weeks, which is where you have the negatives of surgery and sutures and hemodynamic changes, but if you can get a fistula through that initial four weeks by tweaking the system enough, you're likely to get a really good long-term result. And that's really what we were trying to do. But because our stent was biodegradable, the stent was going to be gone after this critical four to six weeks, and so we were going to avoid the long-term negatives of a foreign body in the vascular circulation. So over the last three years, we've really uh, moved forward, uh, I think, uh, quite a lot with the development of this device, and I really want to acknowledge my colleagues in the engineering department at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, and by doing so, I also really want to make the point that if you want to do exciting research, you have to collaborate. And we'll come to that later in the presentation as well. But over the last three years, we've actually gone through a number of different iterations uh, uh, to develop biodegrad biodegradable, uh, where's my arrow? To develop biodegradable uh, uh, stents. And we really went from some initial very crude devices to some much more sophisticated devices. We've developed a new method of making stents which involves photochemical etching uh, and we currently have one patent and six invention disclosures uh, from uh, this work. Uh, very early on, I was, I was very insistent uh, to the engineers. I said that we have to place the stent in a pig because if the pig's going to die when you place a magnesium stent, I'd rather know sooner rather than later. And, and the pig actually did not die. And this is just an example uh, of uh, a biodegradable a stent at the time of fistula creation. You can see a nice big vein. And over here, you see a control fistula with a smaller vein. Uh, we've also been able to demonstrate that we don't get a huge amount of toxicity. Uh, so when you look at histology, you need to look for two things. You need to make sure that there isn't a lot of dark red, which is fibrin, and we don't have that. And then you need to make sure that there isn't a lot of blue, which would be inflammatory cells. And actually, our initial data uh, 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 on histology is, is, is actually quite good. 
Uh, we've also been able, and this is important, we've also been able to get an efficacy signal. So over here you see a CT angiogram in our pig AV fistula model. And if you look over here, you can see the right iliac artery going into the femoral. And over here you see the fistula that has been created with the stent. It's a nice big arteriovenous fistula. If you look on the control side with no stent, you see uh, a very significant perianastomotic stenosis. And this is at 17 days post-surgery. Uh, and we've also been able to demonstrate that out at between 30 to 60 days, we actually have very little of the stent that's left. So the stent is a biodegradable stent. Uh, I personally have actually learned a lot about the pathway for developing a new product. And I, again, I think that it's important to share this with you. We've had a lot of interactions with the uh, uh, intellectual property and the entrepreneurial office at the University of Cincinnati. We've interacted with a local angel investor group. We formed a company, it's totally virtual, uh, called Innovas, but I was pleasantly surprised that it just took 20 minutes on the computer to form the com company, and then I got a letter from the Secretary of State of Ohio saying that, that uh, I am the founder of a company, which was, which was nice, very different from what I normally do. Uh, we've got a name for our product, we've termed it Flow Fluent. We've got a clinical advisory board. We've consulted out for a business and a regulatory plan. And we've really begun to reach out also to, to industry partners that may be interested in this area. So with that, in the last 10 slides or 15 slides, I've really spoken about discovery innovation in vascular access. But what about process innovation in vascular access? So if you think about dialysis vascular access as a whole, perhaps the single most Im important or significant problem that we face is that if you have 100 patients starting on to dialysis in this country, 80 of them, that's 80, start on to dialysis with a tunnel dialysis catheter. And of those 80 patients, only 20 have some sort of fistula that's maturing, which means that six out of 10 patients in this country start on the dialysis without any plan for permanent vascular access. And the reason that this is really important is that if you have a patient start on to dialysis with a tunnel dialysis catheter, their mortality in the first 90 days on dialysis is fivefold, is increased by five times as compared to a patient who starts dialysis with a graft or, or through peritoneal dialysis. Uh, and again, I just want to emphasize that a five-fold increase in mortality is not 20 or 30 percent, it's 500 percent. And we're not talking about morbidity or an additional angioplasty or even a heart attack. We're actually talking about mortality, which is life or death. I think that this is a disgraceful statistic. And it's a disgraceful statistic because it's not a failure of technology or biology but it is an absolute and complete and dismal failure of communication and logistics, sorry, of communication and logistics and process of care. So what's the answer to this? So the answer to this problem is that you need to have a system whereby every patient who starts onto dialysis does so with a functional AV fistula. And the way to do it is actually known to all of us, and it's not rocket science. What you need to do is, you need to have early referral to the nephrologist. You need to have institutional programs in place for vein preservation, so nobody gets a pick line if their GFR is less than 30, and I know that you actually have that in place here at LSU. You need, need to refer patients early for mapping and then for surgery. You need to send your patients to a surgeon who is committed and dedicated and good at creating vascular access. You also need to send your patients to a surgeon who doesn't have a long waiting list because getting vascular access or a fistula in, in a patient who already has a catheter or who is near dialysis is really an emergency. You need to have a system whereby once the fistula is placed, you can follow up Somebody follows that, looks at that fistula in about four to six weeks by physical examination or ultrasound so that if it is not developing well, that patient is referred for angioplasty or surgery. And finally, once the patient is ready to start on to dialysis, because all of this needs to be happened in the CKD phase, but once the patient is ready to start on to dialysis, 
we need to embrace the expert cannulator concept where the best nurse or the technically most skilled person in the dialysis unit actually places the needle into that new fistula for the first three to four times. The problem of course is, and I think many of you in the audience would have experienced this, I know the nephrologists have, that there are barriers to each of these pathways. So if you think about what I've said, and, uh, and what we do obviously is to try and fix the barriers, but if you think about everything I've said about vascular access, in the context of innovation, my view at least is that 70% of the problems in vascular access which kill patients, which cost a lot of money, can in fact be fixed by improvements in the process of care or by innovation in the process of care. Even though our lab has spent all of its time on trying to understand the biology behind vascular access, I would say that biology and technology is only 30% of the problem of vascular access dysfunction. In the next few slides, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the vascular access program that we've developed in Cincinnati. And the reason I'm going to do so is really just to give you an example of a, pro, of a translational research program that we at least feel has some aspects of innovation within it. So the way that we think about vascular access is that even though it's just this small little circle over here, we feel that within this circle, there is in fact a whole world of biology and epidemiology, of pathology and pathogenesis, of clinical and translational research, of novel therapies and technology innovation, and of teaching, training, and very importantly, process of care research. Now, the reason why this vision is important is that even though dialysis vascular access, as I've described to you, is an intractable problem with no really effective therapies. Compared to many other things in medicine, it's actually relatively small and circumscribed. You can actually get your hands around it as compared to, let's say, atherosclerosis or breast cancer. If you're a surgeon, for example, you're actually holding the fistula or really the graft or the catheter in your hand at the time when you're placing it into the patient. And our belief definitely has been that an innovative, translational multidisciplinary program in a single center or in a group of centers that embraces all of these inputs from biology to clinical research, from translational research to technology innovation can in fact completely change existing clinical paradigms for the problem of vascular access dysfunction. One of the things that we have done in Cincinnati, and again, this is, I think that this is a really important slide if you're interested in research or translational innovation, and that is we've collaborated. And you have to collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And we've collaborated with anybody who's interested in collaborating with us and who can actually add to the project. So within the Department of Medicine, we work obviously with nephrologists, but also with cardiology. Within the College of Medicine, we work with surgery and radiology and environmental health and pathology. Uh, we work with the College of Engineering, with the nanotechnology uh, uh, laboratories. We work with the College of Pharmacy, with the VA, with Children's Hospital. Uh, we have really good relationships with the animal facility at the University of Cincinnati. And very, very importantly, uh, we've always had a great working relationship with our community nephrologists that helps us to do a large number of clinical trials. Uh, the other way to describe our program, and this would, this would be true for any translational program, translational research program, is that we really go all the way from basic science and translational research. We have animal models, as I described to you, but then we also do a lot of clinical trials on vascular access, and we have a freestanding access center, not as, not as impressive or not as productive as the one that you have at LSU, but we do a number of angioplasties and stent placements and thrombectomies at our access center. Now the importance of having this sort of, this sort of uh, interconnected modules is that each module not only feeds off, but also enhances the strengths of the other modules and there can be multiple interactions between these different modules. So for example, to give you a couple of examples, we did uh, a lot of work early on with a little device called the OptiFlow. We tested out different iterations in our pig model, uh, and then we were very involved in taking that into clinical trials. So we went from animal models into clinical trials. Another example 
if we identify perhaps using some of our animal models or mouse models a new molecule that we feel is responsible for fistula stenosis, then we can very quickly go to our access center, get blood from patients and see if that molecule is actually increased or decreased in patients that have vascular access problems. And, and the other message I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make from this slide is that it's actually been a lot of fun to do this. And if you're definitely, if you're in academic medicine, uh, I think it's a huge plus to have this sort of integrated program. So that really brings me to the end of the first part of my presentation, the lo a local example of, uh, uh, of translational innovation. And over the next few slides, I'm really going to tell you a little bit about the Kidney Health Initiative, uh, of which I am the American Society of Nephrology co-chair. Uh, and in the second part, I'm going to tell you about why we need an organization like the Kidney Health Initiative. I'm going to tell you what the Kidney Health Initiative is. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the Kidney Health Initiative plans to implement change. So this slide gives you the conventional wisdom about why we need a public-private partnership between the American Society of Nephrology and the FDA, which is what the Kidney Health Initiative is. And, and the conventional wisdom is that there are lots of Americans with kidney disease. There are almost 600,000 patients uh, with kidney failure. There are huge disparities at every stage of renal disease. There are huge problems in the context of the renal toxicity of drugs for non-kidney indi indications. And there really is very little innovation in this field. So that's a conventional view. There is an alternative view that I actually subscribe to about why we need an organization such as the Kidney Health Initiative. And the alternative view is that even though Dr. Abrio and other nephrologists in the audience and, and I, even though we all love nephrology, we think it's a great specialty. If you go outside of nephrology and we go into all of you actually, and you can tell me if you're wrong, I hope, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but if, if I ask all of you about nephrology, I think a lot of you are going to say it's a chronic specialty, the patients are really sick, the nephrologists work really hard, there's a huge disease burden. And in fact, there's nothing really new that's happening in nephrology. And in fact, all of you would be correct because if you look at this slide, which describes to you the number of randomized controlled clinical trials in the different subspecialties of medicine, you've got cardiology and oncology and neurology with the steep upward slope over here. And nephrology is this green line almost parallel to the x-axis right at the bottom. And if you document or tabulate the number of new medicines that have come into nephrology in the last five years, it's basically five of which three have been new formulations. This is clearly not the signature of a dynamic specialty. I know I'm, I'm running nephrology into the ground, actually. But, but I think it really makes the case, and, I, and I'm being provocative. Of course, there are many great things in nephrology, but I, I, I think it could do better. And that's why we have an organization like the Kidney Health Initiative, because what the Kidney Health Initiative wants to do, and I'm going to read out parts of this, is to advance scientific understanding of the kidney health and patient safety implications of new and existing medical products. We want to foster development of therapies for kidney diseases. We want to create a collaborative environment in which FDA and the greater nephrology community can actually interact to optimize the evaluation of drugs, devices, biologics, and food product. That's a long definition. The way that I think about the Kidney Health Initiative is that the main goal of the Kidney Health Initiative is to facilitate the passage of drugs, devices, and biologics into the kidney space. At its heart, the Kidney Health Initiative is a collaborative effort. The four main stakeholders are patients and patient organizations, health professionals, industry partners, and a number of different federal agencies. We currently have over 70 members. Their logos are shown over here. And this just describes the different organizations, nine patient organizations, over 30 industry members, a large number of health professional organizations, including nursing organizations. We've got nine research and academic institutes as members, and we have a number of regulatory and federal agencies as members. So it's not just the Food and Drug Administration, but it's also CMS, which pays the bills, NIH, which does the research, and also CDC. 
We have a board of directors that reflects our membership. And then the most important question, how are we going to achieve, how is the Kidney Health achieve, I, I, Initiative going to achieve the objectives that I described to you earlier? And the way that the Kidney Health Initiative or key is going to achieve what I described earlier to you is to do projects around ideas that have really come forward from our membership, that have bubbled up from our membership. We currently have nine ongoing projects as shown on this slide, but I'm really going to focus on two projects that deal with clinical trial endpoints, one in lupus nephritis and one in dialysis vascular access. So if you think about clinical trial endpoints in lupus nephritis, there are currently no standardized or recommended outcome measures for lupus nephritis clinical trials. So what this means is that different trials use different endpoints and so get different results. One, this is a huge barrier to the development of safe and effective therapies for lupus nephritis. But number two, it makes it completely impossible for any clinician, clinician to compare the results from trial A with trial B to say that drug A is better than drug B. And that really is a problem when you've got a patient with aggressive diffuse proliferative lupus in front of you. The other problem that comes out from this wide variety of endpoints is, and I found this absolutely fascinating, is that if you look, if you take data from a failed trial of lupus nephritis, so no difference in the response rate between the control group and the two treatment groups. But if you take the data from this study, and you then apply the endpoints that were used in another study of lupus nephritis, this low response rate of 3% becomes, converts into a response rate of 25% as compared to 13 in the control group, and this actually achieves statistical significance, even though the initial STAR trial was a failure. So what we are trying to do in collaboration with the Lupus Clinical Trials Network, and this project is led by Brad Rowan from OSU, is that we've got together a very multidisciplinary group of people. Uh, all the names in blue come from the FDA. The names in black are nephrologists. The names in red are actually rheumatologists that play a very important role in the care of lupus patients. And what we're trying and what we've been able to do actually is that we've been able to get access to data sets from a large number of industry and investigator initiated studies. We've put this into a central database using specified data fields and we're now interrogating this database to try and find out short term response measures for lupus nephritis, a change in proteinuria for example that will correlate with how the patient does three to five years down the road and at the end of the day our deliverable we hope will be a set of recommended outcome measures for lupus nephritis. The other clinical trial endpoint study that I want to share with you is one that's close and dear and near to my heart, which is on dialysis vascular access. So we've spoken about vascular access as being both the lifeline, but also the Achilles heel for hemodialysis. And despite it being such a big problem, we really have no effective therapies. And many of us believe that an important reason for the lack of effective therapies is that there really is no consensus on what the right endpoints should be. And part of this is because the different subspecialties caring for people with vascular access dysfunction have very different definitions of what is success. So if you're a radiologist, all you want to see after your angioplasty is a beautiful hundred, no zero stenosis angiogram. If you're a surgeon, you're only concerned about not getting a thrombosis. If you're a nephrologist, the only thing that matters is can the patient actually be dialyzed through the axis so that you don't get a call at 5 in the morning saying that your patient's graft has thrombosed? And I don't think anyone has asked patients about what they feel is important for their vascular access. So again, what we've done in this project is we've really put together a very multidisciplinary work group. Uh, it's got members, it's got radiologists and surgeons and interventionalists and people from the FTA. Uh, and at the end of the day, we will have three white papers with clinical trial endpoints for fistulae, grafts, and for catheters. So why is all of this important? Why are these white papers important? So the white papers are not regulatory guidelines because only the FDA can come up with regulatory guidelines. But we really do believe that the availability of such documents will incentivize and really spur the development 
of novel therapies for renal disease by providing a framework to industry for drug and device development. And the reason that it's important is that let's suppose you're a large pharmaceutical company. You've got this really new, this wonderful new molecule that's anti-inflammatory. And you could develop it for rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease or glomerulonephritis. At the present time, I can tell you that this molecule will not be developed for glomerulonephritis because there really isn't because we don't have well-defined clinical trial endpoints and we don't have a well-defined drug or device development pathway for glomerulonephritis. So in summary, we've been excited, we really are quite excited about what we've been able to do within the Kidney Health Initiative just in the last two years. We do realize that there's a lot more to do. I think we're just scratching at the surface here. But again, we, are, we really feel quite confident that our output which is white papers and workshops and data standards will in fact function as powerful enablers to facilitate the passage of novel therapies into the kidney space so that we can take better care of our patients and so answer the question, is nephrology dead? No, I don't think it is dead and I think we're going to see a lot more excitement in the future and I hope that the Kidney Health Initiative will be a part of this. There is a personal message about the Kidney Health Initiative that I want to share with you and I really think this is important and that is that, that what I've learned in the last two years is that significant progress can in fact be made if you provide a platform or a meeting place for collaboration, so collaboration comes in again, between industry and academia and patients and regulatory agencies and in essence the Kidney Health Initiative is really that platform or meeting place. Uh, I'd like to thank a number of people associated with the Kidney Health Initiative, in particular Patrick Archdeacon, who's my co-chair from the FDA, Ron Falk, who's a past president of the American Society of Nephrology, and the Kidney Health Initiative was really his brainchild. And this is a picture of us with Margaret Hamburg, the FDA commissioner, at our first uh, um, stakeholders meeting. And I also want to recognize our project director, Melissa West. So then finally, in really just in the last uh, five minutes or so, what about translational innovation for global end-stage renal disease or CKD care? And the reason that this is important is that, number one, we know that the number of patients with kidney failure is rising globally. So it was under 1.5 million in the year 2000. It's currently over 3.2 million. But if you ask the question about where end-stage renal disease prevalence is increasing, and you look at US RDS data, it's really not increasing very much by very much in the US. So we've got lots of patients, but the number of new patients every year is only increasing by about 1 to 2 percent. And it's very similar in Japan, and it's similar in the European Union. If you look at Turkey, however, you've got 20 percent growth rates. If you look at Malaysia, you've got 10 percent growth rates. And if you look at the world as a whole, in the year 2000, only a third of patients on dialysis, only a third of dialysis patients were actually dialyzed outside the United States, Europe, or Japan. In 2013, it was over 50%. And this number, or this difference, is going to continue to increase. So why is this happening? Two big reasons. Number one, rapid economic growth in many emerging economies. Number two, the epidemic of diabetes and hypertension, not just in this country, but all over the world. This is a really important slide, and, and it's a slide that really makes the case that of all the therapies in medicine, the one technology or the one therapy that is most closely linked with per capita income or where a country is with regard to its economic development is actually dialysis. So if you look at this slide, You've got ESRD prevalence on the y-axis, you've got GDP per capita in US dollars on the x-axis, and you can see that between $1,000 and $10,000, you've got this very steep increase. It's not really ESRD prevalence, it's really dialysis utilization as countries become richer and therefore have to put patients, or there's an imperative to put their citizens onto dialysis. And the only point I would make is that of the 7 billion people in this world, 6 billion actually live, 6 billion out of 7 live in countries that have per capita GDPs of between $1,000 and $10,000. Uh, the, the diabetes. So there's no question at all that there's a huge worldwide epidemic of diabetes. Uh, when this slide was made about four years ago, it was thought there'd be over 350 million 
diabetics in the year 2030, that number actually now is over 500 million. Most of this increase in the number of diabetics will occur in Asia and in Brazil and in South Africa uh, outside the developed world. And that's going to obviously result in a huge increase in end-stage renal disease numbers. So that's all fine for global demographics on end-stage renal disease, but what does it have to do with translational innovation? So the reason that translational innovation is important is, I, is that I sometimes think of this epidemic of global end-stage renal disease as a setting or a situation where the only light at the end of the tunnel is an oncoming train. It's a huge problem and there are no real solutions and I think we really need to think out of the box in order to develop clinically effective and also cost effective solutions and I really feel that discovery and process innovation has to be a key part of this process. So what do I mean by this? So if you want to do, if you're going to have a huge increase in dialysis numbers in Africa and in South America and in Asia, well what about a portable dialysis machine that is sturdy, that's battery operated, that can regenerate dialysis and that can really run on three liters of bottled water because it doesn't make any sense to import a technology that uses 400 liters of highly purified water to parts of the world where there is a huge water shortage and really outside of North and South America most of the world actually has a significant water shortage. Number two, could you create a cheap dialysis machine without lots of bells and whistles that our dialysis machines have but because it's using state of the art technology it could be extremely effective. Could you develop a nanofilter that could cut the dialysis time, I'm just thinking out of the box here, to one hour and therefore you could dialyze four times as many people in the same amount of time. Uh, could you develop new paradigms for taking dialysis to where patients are, a portable, rarely portable dialysis clinic. That's as applicable in many parts of this country as it is in other parts of the world. Could you think about innovative reimbursement mechanisms where, where the, you don't have a system of, of general insurance for dialysis. The other point that I want uh, to make very quickly is that globally translation innovation is really a two-way win-win process. So the United States in particular but also Europe and Japan have been really good at discovery innovation. Almost every new molecular drug has come out from the US or Europe or Japan. But countries like India and China, Brazil and Brazil have actually been very good at process innovation. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'll give you one example. So there's an ophthalmology center in India which has developed a pathway where if you're doing a cataract surgery, the surgeon sits in one direction and does the surgery and then there's a system that he just swivels around and gets into another sterile compartment. So you cut down the time that it takes between surgeries tremendously. And I would argue that reducing the time to do a cataract by 50 percent is perhaps as innovative or even more innovative as compared to developing a new lens in terms of global patient impact. So finally I want to end with just two very quick messages. The first message is that if we really want to develop innovative therapies, we have to one, identify an unmet clinical need. We need to learn about the biology of this condition and then we need to develop technologies that target the biology. But very, very importantly, you have to tailor this technology to the clinical need and setting. And I'm going to give you one example from dialysis. So three times a week for dialysis patients, we get these patients with a huge clinical morbidity burden. We get them into a high-tech medical environment. And all we do there is we get, I'm going to be cynical about dialysis here, Ken. We get them into the unit. We get them on the machine. We get them off the machine. We get them out of the unit. Right? We basically wash out their blood. What I think we should be doing is that in the dialysis unit, we should be looking after their hearts and their eyes and their leg ulcers uh, and their skin and their vascular access and their psychosocial problems. We do this to a little extent, but we're limited because we don't have the resources to do it all. I think it's a huge opportunity to develop technologies that can be used in a positive manner during the dialysis visit itself. The last point I want to make is that innovation functions best when you create a substrate for in innovation. Sometimes it's an aha moment, but not most times. And if you're a young cardiology fellow, for example, and you have a good idea, is there a mentorship and entrepreneurial pathway in your academic institution that can convert that idea into a product? And you need resources for this. You need commitment. You need teaching and training. You need mentorship pathways. 
You need a core of experienced clinicians and engineers and intellectual property personnel available for guiding this person. And in my mind, you need to have embedded and designated innovation champions in each divisions. We're clearly not there at the present time. At the present time, in an academic institution, we're lucky, if you consider seeds as ideas and saplings as products, I think we're lucky if we get 10 seeds. And we're very, very lucky, in fact, incredibly lucky, if even one of those seeds is probably more like 0.25 of those seeds actually become saplings or products. We just don't have the substrate in most academic institutions to support innovation. We want to be, where I'd like to see us go is, that instead of 10 seeds, we've got 50 seeds or ideas. And instead of one sapling, our conversion rate is actually increased three or four fold so that we get 10 or 20 saplings or new products that can actually help us to take better care of our patients. And then, I'd obviously, at the end, that's really the end of my presentation. I would like to thank our funding sources. Uh, I'd like to thank our many collaborators, both within Cincinnati and outside of Cincinnati. And I'd particularly like to thank the many people in my laboratory, particularly Begonia Campus, who's my lab manager. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. I'd be happy to take some questions. Yes, uh, uh, <clears throat> you close all the things we're doing uh, for better dialysis, which are very good, but then you told us that the number of patients with renal failure in the world is increasing. Uh, what can we do to keep uh, people from developing renal failure in the first place? Right, yes, yeah, so, so, so that's a very good point. And, you know, because I, I guess uh, my own interests are more technology driven, uh, driven. I focus more on, on uh, dialysis. But I would say that you know, prevention of, for progression of kidney disease is very important. But I would say that many of the same concepts that I've described could actually be very, I focus more on dialysis, but I think many of the concepts could also be applied, uh, for innovation at least, could also be applied to the problem of, of prevention of the progression of chronic kidney disease. Prevention is always better than cure. Always. How many of you, let me ask a question if you know, how, how many of you have, 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 have ever thought, well, I wish I could do things differently and wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be nice if there was a better way of treating this patient, whether it's a little stop that prevents blood from gushing out when you put a central line in, uh, or a better or a better computer system or a better system of nurses getting in touch with you. I mean, how many of you have thought about that? All right. So some of you have. And how many have, have thought about, well, if we did it this way, it would actually be better? <coughs> so a few of you. And, and how many of you have actually done something about that? Or have thought about, well, is there a way that I can do something about this? Or how many of you have done something about it? That's going to be very interesting. No hands. So, so you know, I, I guess what I would say is, I mean, it's really important to think about how you could do things better. And small things that you think about may be really, really important or may lead to really important things. The problem is how do you, how do you convert that thought or idea into something that helps patients? And, you know, the only thing I would say is that don't give up and, and think about ways that you can, you, you can do this. I think even in most institutions, they do have an inter, you do have an intellectual property office. Uh, you will have at least some people who are interested in changing things. And the only thing that I would say is that ideas are often best when you're younger. And as you get older, your ideas are not so good. Your ability to convert the ideas into reality actually is more as you go older, but I don't think your ideas are better. So I would again, I would encourage all of you to be, if you have ideas, to really treasure them. They could be really, really important. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.